Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, forging a utility knife and some hard lessons learned. So today I felt like just going out in the shop and screwing around and kind of making something up as I went along. The idea was to make a little shop utility knife and uh, do it with really no plan whatsoever. There are some pitfalls to doing it this way and we'll find out what they are. I'm forging a piece of 3 16 by 1 inch 1095 high carbon steel. 1095 is a simple high carbon steel composed of roughly 99% iron, 1% carbon, and a pinch of manganese. It's about as close as modern steels get to what a knife maker would have used in Sheffield, England a couple centuries ago. I'm really just putzing around here. I'll need to narrow the blank to around 5 8 to 3 quarters of an inch before I begin forging in earnest. I'll also put a point on it. As a general rule, I try to avoid using tongs, so you'll see me switching to tongs and then back a couple of times. Tongs never hold your work as securely or accurately as your hands. Once I've got a really rough blank, I'll forge the bevels. The crucial thing with forging any western style blade is you want to forge the ricasso cleanly and symmetrically. That's the little portion between the blade and the tang. Once you start, you can't let the ricasso onto the face of the anvil at all or you'll knock the blade over to one side of the knife and have a hell of a time ever getting it back. Alright, that seems okay, so I'll hot cut the blade off the bar on my cutoff hardy. Then I'll turn it around and forge a tang. Like most forged knives, this will have a hidden tang, meaning the tang will be entirely enclosed in the handle. I'll normalize the blade, heating it to about 1600 degrees, then letting it cool. This removes forging stresses from the blade and accomplishes some other metallurgical goals that I won't get into here. Now usually I normalize the blade three times, but today I'm just trying to get the knife finished in one day, so I'm taking a shortcut.
Now I'll grind the blade close to its final shape. I've done lots of videos about grinding techniques, so I won't talk too much here about what I'm doing. Basically, I'm just flattening it a little, then cleaning up the lines as forged, then grinding the bevels. Next, it's time for the most underappreciated aspect of knife making, heat treating. 1095 can be heat treated by quenching in oil or in water. It's sort of on the borderline of hardenability in oil. Now normally I quench 1095 in oil because of the possibility of cracking. But today, because I'm just screwing around, I think I'll quench it in water. So it's up to about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. The steel becomes non-magnetic at about 1425, so once the magnet stops sticking, I know I'm almost there. And boom, right into the water. Just a second on the edge, then out, then back in again. This is called an interrupted quench, the point of which is to slow the quench just a hair to minimize the likelihood of cracking. Now I'm leaving the tang out so that it will remain soft. A quick check with the file, it skates across the steel nicely showing proper hardening. Then into my heat treating oven at 400 for an hour. A quick cleanup on the grinder verifies what I suspected. Yep, the blade cracked. There was a time when a cracked blade really sent me into a tailspin, and sure, if this was a folded steel katana that I'd already invested a hundred hours of work into, yeah, I'd be shambling around the house with that pitiful expression of anguish on my face. But today is all about lessons. A lesson isn't a failure, right? And the lesson? Well, first, avoid water quenching at all costs. Even for lower carbon steels that are considered to be water quenching steels, there are generally better solutions. For instance, fast quenching oils like Parks 50. I water quench my Japanese blades, but in a much more complex way than I did here. Second lesson, I played fast and loose with a lot of the little details that I would normally be pretty conscientious about, including normalizing three times, quenching in a darker room so I can see the colors more accurately, quenching into warmer water, not thinning the edge quite as much as I did, and several other things. When it comes to heat treating, details matter. One or two of you may have seen me on the TV show Forged in Fire, and something happened there that you might have thought, well, how come that happened? The short answer, same as here, heat treating can't be rushed. All right, let's do a slow motion replay. Into the water, again.
that is the sound of a blade cracking. All right, now I could throw this in the trash, but since we're living in video land, I'm gonna pretend that this blade didn't break and I'll go ahead and finish it up just like it was perfect. So next, I'll wrap the blade with tape and notch the tang. I'm using a filing guide that I made myself to give a really clean square edge to the tang. This technique's typically used with guards, but I'm just using it to seat the blade cleanly against a wooden handle. I've got a video about making the filing jig. If you want plans, they're available to all my Patreon supporters. Click the link, you can sign up to support the channel and have access to plans on my Patreon page. There are only a few plans on there right now, but I'm gonna be adding more over time. So, on to the handle. I'll be making a sandwich type handle with the corned beef being mahogany and the bread being purple heart. I'll start with this little wedge of mahogany. Mark a hole and cut it out on the bandsaw. Then the purple heart is cut and flattened. After using some acetone to remove oil from the purple heart, I'll glue everything up. I'm keeping the tang inside during the initial phase of clamping so that the pieces don't creep. What happens sometimes when you clamp things with glue is that if there's any opportunity for them to move around a little bit, they will. And sometimes, especially for knives where you have to have a very, very accurate hole in between the pieces, if it shifts around a little bit, you won't be able to get that tang in there. So once the glue starts to firm up though, I'll pull it out so that the tang doesn't stick inside the hole. A little very careful cleanup of the face. Now if I do this too aggressively I can muck up the angle and my carefully filed tang won't fit flush to the wood. Now I'll epoxy the tang into the handle. I'm doing this mostly to assure that it doesn't move inside the channel, not to actually glue it inside the handle. Retention inside the handle will be the job of a couple of homemade mosaic pins. I'll drill the holes. and we insert the pins, epoxying them in place. Once the epoxy is cured, it's back to the grinder. Now, at this point, I have zero idea how I want this blade to look. My guess as I move into it is that it'll end up somewhere towards the prison shank end of the spectrum, given that I have no plan as to how to knock the ugly off of it. As I try to make something up that won't be excessively embarrassing, I'll show you a bunch of non-manufacturer approved ways that you can use a belt grinder. The deal is that a flat platen has some very serious limitations. It's good at flat, but not much of anything else. It's not good at smooth transitions, curves, things of that nature. 
So I'll use all kinds of different surfaces on here and kind of sneak my way into smooth transitions. Now you could go back and forth between various fixtures, but this is easier. Bear in mind, if you do the top of the knife on the belt routine like I'm doing here, I strongly advise standing to the side for safety's sake. Here's where my shape landed. Doesn't suck as much as I anticipated. I think your average dirtbag felon could hold up their heads showing this one off to their buddies in the prison yard. Now a little hand sanding. And some tongue oil. Then a final buffing and we're done. And now, why heat treating matters. Oops. Easy come, easy go. So anybody who's watched this channel for a while knows that I'm a big proponent of success through failure. In other words, you have to try different things and fail in order to accumulate the knowledge that you need to do to, to be successful or to do really good work. You know, I've been making blades for 20 years now. Uh, every now and then I do crack a blade. I could have just started all over and, uh, you know, pretended that I didn't break this blade. But hey, look, uh, even when you've been at something for a long time, as I've been doing this, you know, for almost 20 years now, uh, failures happen. It's good to have those little lessons every now and then. And, um, you know, I, I think it's fun to share them with you guys. All right, see you soon. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamones or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamones as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!